please welcome Bradley Kuhn. So, uh, so I, I, always, I always have challenging scheduling. I have to follow Tridge talking about something fun. It wasn't even like it was a technical samba talk or something. It, so my, my talk will not be as fun as Tridge's, but I think it will be important. Uh, and it relates to what Tridge is working on, in fact, what all of us are working on. Uh, because we are working on free software, and we have a strategy to defend free software, which is copyleft. I always start uh, talks about copyleft with that because a lot of people who are sub otherwise supportive of free software feel like copyleft is a principle onto itself. I don't think it actually is. It was a plan to try and maximize software freedom. And if we're going to be uh, thoughtful about it, we should think about that question of whether it's a succeeding strategy. Our goal is software freedom. Our strategy is copyleft, at least for some of our community. The strategy works by forcing those who would choose to proprietorize the free software that we've written to either liberate their software or go away and use something else that's not copyleft. Um, I don't object to reconsidering the question. We should, in fact, as introspective people, say, is the strategy working that we have to defend software freedom? It, are there any better strategies that we could be using? And if there are better strategies or alternative strategies that are worth pursuing, do they in any way conflict with copyleft? You can probably guess what my answers to these questions are. And one of the reasons I still think it's a good strategy is we ran in parallel an experiment. You don't often get to do that in history. Usually you get one choice in history and you try it, and you never know if you had tried a different strategy it would have worked. But as it turns out, because there are disagreements in our community about whether copyleft is a good strategy, for many decades people have been writing both non-copyleft-ed and copyleft-ed free software. And I would agree that if you looked at non-copyleft-ed free software and said, wow, there's actually never been a proprietary version ever created of any non-copyleft-ed free software, I would probably say, well, I, we probably didn't need that copyleft strategy in the first place because no one was actually planning to proprietorize our software. But that's not what happened. I've looked. I have yet to find a piece of software that's non-trivial and useful that hasn't had at least one proprietary version. I don't know of an example. And certainly the very good non-copyleft-ed uh, software programs have a tendency to be proprietorized quite often. In fact, they often have many, many versions that are proprietary. I admit that both for the Software Freedom Conservancy where I work and for myself personally, I host my VPSs, which I still call them that because I'm old, I suppose. I, what am I supposed to call them these days? I don't know. Anyway, I host my virtual machines on Rackspace. When I log into my Rackspace account or into Conservancy's corporate Rackspace account, I see that it looks a whole lot like OpenStack. But it's not exactly OpenStack, which I know because my friend has a default OpenStack install, which he also has some machines for me that I used to run. And his interface doesn't have as many features as the Rackspace interface. And we all know that Rackspace was the originator of OpenStack, which means they put a lot of the code out there, which is great. but. I don't know of a OpenStack product that doesn't have at least a few changes that are not released back upstream. Now, we could solve this problem by forking OpenStack under the Affero GPL. I was really glad to hear Martin Fink of HP say that we should start forking non-copyleft-ed projects, and I'm hoping HP will soon be releasing their Affero GPL fork of OpenStack. Um, I don't think it's going to happen very soon. Uh, but this is the kind of thing we have to start to consider. There is more and more non-copyleft-ed software being written every day. And copyleft, while it's not the only strategy available to advance software freedom, is one of the better ones. And I still think it's a very viable strategy. And the reason it's not working as well is because there's less copyleft-ed software in the world. Apple is actually a very conservative company, and they didn't try to just take the Linux and proprietorize it. They built their operating system around BSD because it was not copylefted. And I think that we can continue with copyleft as a strategy, and it doesn't contradict any other strategies we might have. 
Many people often tell me, well, you know, CopyLeft is so aggressive, you're enforcing the GPL all the time, and it upsets people, and I think it's better just to convince them in a friendly way to change their behaviors. I am glad other people are pursuing those strategies. I hope you understand why, given my history and reputation with the GPL, it's not all that easy for me to suddenly change to that strategy, because no one really believes that I'm just going to ask politely, which I always do first and usually don't succeed at. The people that I end up dealing with are the ones who will not respond to a polite request to stop violating the GPL. So while we should have other strategies to defend software freedom, I think we should continue with the copyleft one as well. Now, copyleft has not been popular in recent years. Uh, Martin Fink's keynote uh, at, uh, in Dublin uh, that I mentioned was one of the few times I've seen anyone in the corporate world say anything positive about copyleft in probably uh, five years or so. At my talk last year here, I talked about the attacks and the challenges that copyleft face. I'm curious to get a show of hands of how many people either saw my talk from last year online or otherwise have seen a similar version of that talk. Okay, about half. I'll go, I'll, uh, some, of you, some of the next few slides might be redundant for those of you about that. But one of the key points I talked about last year was the idea of co-option in free software. What's happened is those companies that were once, the people we talked about as enemies, the people who wrote proprietary software and marketed it, um, companies like Microsoft who used to say horrible things about us, well, they are embracing free software. All of them, basically, more or less. Apple may be the only, may, almost the only exception, although they released Swift as a non-copy-lifted system, so even Apple is doing a little bit. What they've discovered is they could not beat us by bad rhetoric. They could not beat us by out-inventing in proprietary software. So they're going to have to use some free software. And as people like me, pundits like me, have predicted since 2000, they would try to draw the line between copyleft and non-copyleft. And in fact, it's gotten worse because there's all these different groups of people trying to say they speak for our community and that our community really doesn't want copyleft anymore. You will find quite a bit of this rhetoric going on all the time in our community now. And it makes it very dangerous to be pro-copyleft, and I don't blame many of you who now are only quietly and clandestinely pro-copyleft because it is considered suddenly amazingly more politically radical than it used to be. I don't even think it is. Now, not in the GNU Linux kind of community, but in other communities, uh, like uh, JavaScript people, those sorts of things, I often hear things like, well, everyone really prefers the permissive licenses, or uh, you really can't get funding for a copyleft-ed uh, package. You really have to do what the companies want. They all want the non-copyleft-ed stuff. And th there's no single source for this kind of rhetoric, right? It's just everyone, it, but everybody knows that nobody likes copyleft anymore. Oh, that's, that's old hat. Um, I'm reminded of this phrase, I don't speak German very well, but Germans have this phrase called Mansacht, which in English we often say, they say. There are some entity out there, and it's not even, it's nebulous. Somebody says, people say, right? And that's all you have to do to really give, if you do it enough times and get enough other people to be saying the same thing, eventually people start to believe it, at least if they don't question where their sources are coming from and who really believes what. On the other hand, people who actually support copyleft have a pretty common confusion. I frequently hear something like this. I copylefted my code, and now it's going to be free software forever. I took care of it. I, I gave it the office. My code's copylefted. I, I, I've coined the phrase recently that the copyleft is not magic pixie dust. You don't sprinkle it on some code, and then suddenly your code is liberated forever. I wish that were true, but that's not how the world works, unfortunately. Somebody has to actually work to ensure copyleft succeeds as a strategy. And that means people have to do that work. Somebody has to be entrusted with doing that work. For better or worse, I think Software Freedom Conservancy is now the primary organization that's doing it because everyone else is, in some, other than the Free Software Foundation, everyone else is too afraid to. Uh, I don't really blame them, but we're pretty lonely up here. One of the other unfortunate things that's happened because of the way that co-option has occurred in free software is there is a lot more political activity around free software that wasn't there before. 
And I'm not talking about developer politics. I'm not talking about arguments about system D versus a net. That's a different type of politics. I'm talking about the types of politics where companies are saying, how do we manipulate this free software community that we have to our own ends? This is how politics work in the world, and there's a lot of it in free software. I've often called myself an accidental politician because my goal was to be a free software developer, but I found once I got into copyleft and copyleft policy, I suddenly had to be a politician to survive. Because our political system is very tough. No one is elected. There is no opportunity for the public to really scrutinize what's happening. Most of what occurs is all in very strange back channels. But the results, I think, are visible. Last year when I gave this, uh, a similar talk rather, I asked everybody to stop ignoring the politics, so I want to take a poll to see how well we're doing. So if you're employed writing software, Raise your hand as I go through these percentages of how, what percentage of the code you write at work, just at work, are you allowed to release as free software? So how many of you are employed writing software and release at least 10% of your code that you write in your full-time job? Okay, 25%, put your hand down if it's less than 25%. Less than 35%? Less than 50%. About half the hands are still up, which is good, because if you're at the 50% point, you're break even, which means if you spend 50% of your time writing proprietary software and 50% time writing free software, you're a net nothing on the world, net zero, because you've canceled yourself out by writing 50% proprietary, writing 50% free. Okay, if you can get above 50%, you're a net positive on the world. You're making an impact by liberating some software. But there's actually a much worse problem, just whether you're writing free software. Now, are you allowed to copyleft the software you write? So if you're employed writing software, are you allowed to release it under a copyleft license? Okay, it's actually about the same number of hands, which is good, but no, don't put your hand down yet. Only put your hand down if you hold your own copyrights on that software. Your employer does not hold copyright on it. It doesn't exist in most jurisdictions. Um, so put your hands down if your employer holds your copyrights, right? So we've got like five hands left up, right? What, what's backwards, Keith? I, I thought I put my hand down if I did hold my own copyrights. Okay, so Keith holds his own copyrights. We're glad to hear that. Sorry? He was just pointing, he just was confused about which, when to put his hand down, so he's, he does hold his own copyrights. But there are very few people in the room that do. Um, you can put your hand down, Keith. We know you hold your own copyrights now. Um, so. The ones who can keep your own copyrights, you, you're actually the only ones who can do anything about this for copyleft. So you have to be not only copylefting your code, but hold your own copyrights. This is because of enforcement. If a copyleft license is never enforced, it's indistinguishable from a non-copylefted license in practice. Here's why. Because everybody, even in the Apache community, other non-copylefted communities, Teo de Rat himself, they frequently urge people who take their software to give code back. It's not considered unallowed in non-copyleft communities to use whatever means necessary, uh, including email campaigns, which uh, OpenBSD has done, to ask companies to give their code back. Only copyleft has a strategy that can, in those cases, where a company refuses to do that, have a legal mechanism to compel them to do that. And that legal mechanism is enforcement. The problem with companies holding copyrights in GPL software is they are never going to do enforcement on behalf of the community. If they enforce the GPL at all, they're going to do it for other means. Remember, GPL is a strategy, not a principle. Strategies can be used for a variety of different goals. The interesting thing is that for years, developers have criticized the FSF for demanding copyright assignment, which they demand primarily to be able to enforce the GPL. Now, through my work on the BusyBox enforcement, I've shown that you don't need an overwhelming majority of the copyrights to actually succeed in enforcement. But the interesting thing is all this time the FSF's been criticized for asking for copyright assignment, most people have been giving the copyright to their employers anyway. So the largest single assignment system in place is work for hire. It's being hired by a company and giving them your copyrights. And then the tool of copyleft, the strategy of copyleft, is no longer in your hands. It's in the hands of your com company. 
And they're holding most of the copyrights in most key free software, even copylefted programs today. Now, it's not that for-profit companies don't enforce the GPL, sometimes they do, but they're usually exploiting it for goals other than software freedom, most commonly monetary gain. This is why last year the Free Software Foundation and Conservancy got together and published what we call the Principles of Community-Oriented GPL Enforcement. The goal is to explain what it means to enforce the GPL with the strategy of maximizing software freedom. And there's a link on these slides. When you see them online, you can click through and read these principles. A few charities have endorsed them, including the Open Source Initiative and others. But it's interesting to note that not a single trade association or for-profit company has endorsed these principles. Why? Because their political strategy is very different. If they're doing copyleft at all, they generally don't want to see it enforced unnecessarily on behalf of the community. Either, as I said before, they're encouraging people to avoid copyleft altogether and contribute under non-copyleft licenses, and more and more developers are being funded only to work on non-copylefted software. And in cases where projects are copyleft, we see a myriad of strategies being employed by companies in the space to avoid copyleft enforcement happening. The one I've already mentioned, they encourage the contributors to make sure they've given the copyrights to the companies. If they have the uh, copyrights, the companies are unlikely um, to enforce them on behalf of the community, if at all. I'm going to talk more in a few minutes about the level to which various different industry um, initiatives have sought to vilify people like me who are doing enforcement for the community. And in those rare cases where the companies enforce the GPL, it's done with uh, what I would say not a community goal. The most common of these we've seen for a very long time. Uh, MySQL AB would be the first example that was widely known of this, of enforcing the GPL with the goal not being to get compliance, not being to get more code liberated in the world, but to get the enforcee to buy a proprietary license for the same code base. This is a very common business model used by companies like TenGen for MongoDB and many others, not to just pick on those two. You can find many companies who hold all the copyrights in their product, they release it under a copyleft license, and walk around to uh, companies that use it and say, pretty nice business you got here. It'd be a shame if you were violating the GPL. Maybe you just better buy a proprietary license. That's a corruption, in my view, of what copyleft was intended to do. It was intended to encourage code liberation, not generate revenue for specific companies. There are other examples of companies basically doing a little bit enforcement and then when, when things got tough, giving up on the GPL. In a case a few years ago of uh, Twin Peaks uh, versus Red Hat, a US court case, uh, which was settled, Red Hat raised the counterclaim of GPL violations by Twin Peaks. Twin Peaks has a proprietary Linux module, which I'm going to talk about proprietary Linux modules in details in a few minutes. But Red Hat said, well, that's violating the GPL and all the other things. Red Hat had copyrights in Linux, of course, and Mount and other programs that Twin Peaks was infringing. But as the court case settles, which was primarily a patent case, Red Hat got a license for the patent uh, that Twin Peaks held. And Twin Peaks module is still, to this day, as far as I know, a proprietary Linux module. So in the cases where companies will do enforcement, they're not particularly likely to fight all the way to the wall for software freedom. So I, I'm going to pick on lawyers, which was harder to do at Fosdem, uh, where I just came from, than it is here, because there's probably fewer lawyers in the room. And it's not that I'm saying all lawyers are bad. The problem is it's a dangerous profession for those of us that aren't lawyers. And here's why. If you work for a company, your company probably has a lawyer. That is not your lawyer. That is your company's lawyer. When they say things, they're not giving you legal advice. They're not giving the free software project that you contribute to legal advice. They are giving the best legal advice to benefit the for-profit interests of the company. If you aren't paying them yourself, they are probably not your lawyer. In which case, what they're saying may or may not be good for free software or be good advice for free software. And what I've seen in the past, mostly in the past three years, uh, maybe the last five, is that corporate lawyers have gained a tremendous amount of control over the free software policies at most large companies, and even some small ones as well. And not only that, the corporate lawyers who would rather the copyleft would just go away are amazingly well coordinated with each other. 
There are secret meetings. I know of at least two venues that provide a regular opportunity for lawyers to meet, and it's not their only agenda item, but on the agenda is, you know, how do we make this copy left less a problem for us? It's usually characterized in terms of, well, we just want to have some what-if discussion about, well, you know, what if this, what if that, um, about the copy left to see, you know, we just want to understand it because we're, we're, you know, we're good lawyers, we want to explore every side of the issue. But what it really is is strategizing how to fight copy left. And this goes on regularly. The reason I know it is because fortunately we have a few double agents. As I said, not all lawyers are bad. Um, so th there are some who leak me information from time to time, and I don't want to just say there's some conspiracy out there. I don't think it's really a conspiracy. Uh, last year I called it an, on, uh, a, a spontaneous, uncoordinated alignment of self-interest among various parties, which I still think it is. Um, but there are a couple examples I can use this year that maybe will give you a sense. So last year I'm aware of two separate meetings where a bunch of for-profit corporate lawyers got together specifically to discuss how do we encourage more company copyrights in GPL software rather than individual copyrights because individual copyrights generate risk because individuals might decide to enforce the GPL in a way that we, the corporate copyright holders, don't feel is a good idea. So they're strategizing, but how do, how do, we, how do we limit the amount of copyright you all get to hold in various GPL works? This, I only had the one example before, but this week, I just on my way here, I got another example. So we're currently doing a GPL enforcement action at Conservancy against a large company that you've all heard of. Uh, there's not a person in this room who hasn't heard of this company. And in response to some issues we raised about their GPL compliance, this lawyer, whom I know was involved in these recent back-channel discussions, which I also heard about, they're trying to reestablish this idea that Linus Torvalds one day gave an exception that allowed all proprietary Linux modules to exist. Um, this did not happen, but this is the, the myth that these lawyers have promulgated. He came around and restated that myth and then said, oh yeah, and we think that your whole enforcement here is violating those principles you just published. Right? This is a coordinated strategy. Come back to us and say, oh, you, you, you published some principles last month, uh, last, or three months ago. And now I'm going to accuse you of violating your own principles, so I don't think we were. Um, but this is the kinds of strategies that they build and come up with. This is, this is the world I live in. If I seem like, I, like I'm always unhappy, it's because I'm, I spend more time talking to these type of people than I do talking to all of you. But somebody has to do that. If we think copyleft is the right strategy, we've got to deal with these challenges. We've got to deal with the fact that our opponents are a lot more savvy than they used to be, and they're creating, in my view, somewhat of a crisis for copyleft and free software generally. So we, we certainly need, and so I have to do this off the screen, I'm sorry. So we start, ah, my mouse will not move. So we need a plan. Have you got a plan, my lord? Yes, I have, and it's so cunning you could brush your teeth with it. So I certainly hope my plan is cunning. I'm going to try. Um, and even if my plan's not cunning, I, I really do always have a plan. How many times do I have to tell you, Joe? I always have a plan. So that's a clip from Lost, and there's this character in there named Ben who is obsessed with saving this island that they're all lost on. He always serves the island. He does... Armies of proprietors. I have a couple of ideas that we need to try as a plan, which I hope is a cunning plan to solve this. It's become clear that when you have multi copyright held works, you are more likely to succeed in GPL enforcement because you have more opportunity and more people who care about it. Because individuals and charities who hold copyright in copylefted software are much more likely to enforce the license on behalf of communities. And it's pretty clear that for-profit trade associations and companies will not do that. So the first plan we need is, I think all of you who write software for a living, those of you who had to put your hands down because you don't hold your copyright, go back to your employer and insist that you be allowed to hold your own copyright. Developers are some of the best paid workers in our society now. 
So I don't think you need to unionize to make more money, but maybe you should unionize to demand all your copyrights back and say, we aren't going to write any more software unless we have our copyrights. And we know that many rock star developers do get their copyrights and do get to keep them. Keith does, for example. Um, so we need more developers who aren't rock stars to also be asking for it. And if enough of them do, there won't be anybody to hire who doesn't insist on it. And once you do, you can join one of our coalitions, if it's in the Samba project, or the Mercurial project, or Linux, or any of the other member projects of Conservancy, you can join one of our coalitions to work with Conservancy to enforce the GPL. The other solution that I think we need um, is, given that companies are continuing to tell people to avoid copyleft for new projects, I'm not demanding that you refuse to work on non-copyleft projects. I think that's probably counterproductive um, and uh, antisocial, frankly. Uh, and if they're going to pay you to write free software, even if it's not copyleft, that's a pretty good job in my view. But most of free software was written in the early days by people who went home at night after writing proprietary software all day and wrote free software in their nights and weekends. Now, I work for Conservancy usually 12 hours a day. I work all my nights and weekends, and I'm going to ask you to do the same. When you come home from your job writing non-copylefted software, find a copylefted project that you like and contribute to it. And also make sure that your employer doesn't, as they can in some jurisdictions, claim copyright over the work that you do on your home on your own computer, so that you can have your own copyrights and contribute to key projects that we need. Because we actually, um, you know, forget that, we actually need more copylefted packages that are innovative and inventing interesting things like we had in the 1980s and early 1990s. They were hobbyist projects first, and they invented great stuff. And in some cases, we should be willing to fork non-copylefted projects. There's been a taboo on that that thankfully Martin Fink lifted by saying that we should do it, we should do it. In a case where the community is having lots of proprietized version, we should be happy to fork it. However, neither of those two items will work if we don't enforce copyleft. Um, and the opponents are getting better. So they're working to replace the copylefted programs we have. Toybox exists because people didn't want BusyBox anymore because I was enforcing the GPL on BusyBox. LVM was a university project, but the resources that Qualcomm and Apple are putting into LVM are undeniably because they would prefer a world without GCC. They will tell you that's not true. They will tell you it's because the technology is better. In fact, it is better. LVM is probably a better compiler than GCC. RMS is going to listen to this and be mad at me, but it's a fact. Technologically, the problem is that it's not copylefted. And the things we succeeded with with a copylefted compiler for all these years are going to start to slip through our fingers because LLVM is going to overtake GCC. In fact, it's starting to become difficult to figure out if there are any copylefted programs left that are essential. Here's the problem. Copyleft only works when someone won't write the other program from scratch, or, write, or rewrite the program from scratch, right? If they look at it and say, ah, I'll just write my own version that's not copyleft, that I can hire some developers and do that. You have to have software that industry is begging to have, so much so that they're willing to liberate their software. Because the default's going to be to proprietorize it, but if they say, well, if I don't proprietorize, I get to incorporate this great stuff, that stuff has to be great enough that they'll make that calculation. Linux may be the last copylefted program that we're going to have a serious fight over. It's the one program that they've chosen not to rewrite, but to attempt to get around copyleft. For years, we've debated what, what is a combined work? Is Linux module, uh, a Linux uh, kernel module, a combined work with Linux? Um, I'll say that I, I don't claim to know what courts are going to decide about this question. I certainly know, having worked in this field for 20 years, I've never seen a Linux module that I didn't think was a combined work when shipped with Linux. So if there is a way to write a kernel module that's not a combined work, it's some strange unicorn that we've never seen, or at least I've never seen. But these same corporate lawyers I'm talking about have been working for years on strategies to get around this problem, to keep proprietorizing Linux module modules. And through a, an accident of history, and it's not, I'm not denigrating Linux developers, it's because Linux is such amazing technology that it's become the center, but for various historical reasons, like LVM coming into existence and being funded and other such things, Linux is where the battleground of copyleft is going to be. It's the one program that 
all of these companies have said, you know what, we're not going to rewrite that. Instead, we're going to stand our ground here. We're going to tell our clients, we think that they're going to have to fight this in court. And we think you have more money than them, which means you can probably outspend them. So go ahead and make proprietary kernel modules and wait for somebody like Conservancy to come along and sue you and then call me up, your law firm lawyer, and I'll get on conference calls for you and charge you a mere $500 to $1,000 an hour uh, to make them go away, bury them in paper. And companies have widely bought this argument. We will have to have many fights in many jurisdictions over the next 10 years about Linux kernel modules. It is where copyleft is going to be decided. It's what's going to decide is the LGPL and the GPL the same thing, which is actually where they're headed, right? Pretty much every company will say, well, if it's LGPL, then I'm fine with it, right? I can make proprietary add-ons, that's good. And if, I would admit, if Linux were LGPL'd, kernel modules would be permitted by, under the LGPL's exceptions to the GPL. But Linus chose a strong copyleft license. I think he did it for a reason. And he said that it was the best choice he ever made. And there are plenty of copyright holders in Linux who contributed because they believed that strong copyleft was better than a weak copyleft or better than a non-copylefted license. And we're going to have to actually adjudicate that. We don't have a choice now. Uh, I used to shy away from this because it, it's considered so controversial, but we, we, can't, we won't have copyleft if we don't have this confrontation. Because for years, they've been building up plans to make more and more proprietary Linux modules. In fact, it, the entire GPL violation space is very different from when I first started. When I give a talk about GPL enforcement uh, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, I would always say, oh, it's you know, usually common mistakes and the, you know, innocent errors and people want to fix it and once you talk to them and educate them, everything's fine. And it's certainly true that there are plenty of violators out there like that. I've often called it the eternal September of GPL violations. There will always be new companies that never heard of GPL and are really making innocent mistakes. Um, and we'll solve those in due course because we know how to solve them and that's what we've been doing for years. But now there are a plethora of truly dangerous violators whose goal is to test the boundaries of what they can make proprietary in a GPL'd work and who's going to stop them and how. They're ready to test it because they think they can win. And they hire good lawyers who have been following what we do in our community for a very long time. They're, they're difficult opponents to deal with. Um, I get some pretty nasty emails from corporate lawyers really well politically drafted to manipulate us and attack us. Uh, it's now common. It really is a zero-sum game at this point. We win and we get more software liberated. They win and they get to keep proprietary stuff that was supposed to be free under copyleft. There's no other way to model it now. The goals of copyleft are diametrically opposed to the goals of many companies uh, who want to exploit Linux for their own uses. So for years, um, people have complained that we don't do enough enforcement. So there's this segment, small segment of the population who are like, well, you're just not enforcing enough. I've had uh, people come to me and say, well, you're not enforcing against this party or that party who's violating. And I've often said I've seen hundreds of GPL violations every year and work on only, only 10 or 15 at most. And certainly there are people out there trying to do enforcement for profit. One of the reasons we publish those principles of GPL enforcement is because I think any type of enforcement that seeks to make a profit is actually a path for corruption. It's been the case since the very beginning that the first question a GPL violator asks the Conservancy when we do an enforcement action is, well, how much do I pay for a license? How much is it? This is like MySQL, right? You just tell me how much I pay and I buy a proprietary license and I go on my merry way. And when we begin telling them, well, we, we would like to get our costs recovered, we think it's reasonable for you to pay our costs to bring you into compliance, uh, there should be some deterrent and penalty for your violation that's financial because you're a for-profit company, which you understand is money. The most important thing is not that. The most important thing is that you comply with the license, and you must comply, and we won't take your money until you comply. Now, the interesting thing is that the longer it takes them to comply, which sometimes, actually not sometimes, typically it's, it's three to five years, to get a company from discovering the violation to actually getting compliance, the number goes down exponentially that they're willing to pay. And by the end, we're lucky if we recover our costs once they're fully in compliance. I've come to the conclusion in the last year 
that the only way to fund GPL enforcement done in the right way is by community donors. Uh, I'm sorry to say that to people who have been saying, well, I shouldn't have to give my money because these violators are bad and they should be paying. In a moral sense, I agree with you. In a practical sense, I don't. Perhaps it is a flaw in copy left from the beginning that we didn't think about the financial component of how do we keep funding an organization that's going to fight for software freedom in a political climate where there's a lot of anti-copy left and a lot of desire to exploit copy left to code in proprietary ways. You can blame us for not making a cunning plan early enough to solve it. It could be true. But at this point, we at Conservancy have to fundraise from the public to fund enforcement because it will not be self-funding. So, <coughs> Trish asked you in your talk, I'm going to ask you in my talk as well, uh, I, I don't like fundraising. I hired Karen Sandler to take my job as executive director at Conservancy because I'm so bad at it. But I'm going to do a little bit of it here and ask you to, uh, to give us money because what we're seeking is a mandate from the public to help us enforce. Not this kind of mandate, but that kind of mandate. We need people to come to us and say, we want you doing this work. This helps us in a couple of different ways. First of all, developers who have already joined our coalition, and if you're a copyright holder in Linux, Samba, BusyBox, uh, Mercurial, or any other uh, package you see as a member of Conservancy, you can come to us and you can give us that kind of mandate to enforce the license on your behalf for your copyrights. Or you can, if you don't want your copyrights anymore, you can also assign them to us, but either one is fine. But we also need a financial mandate from, developer, from community members who care about enforcement and want to see it done. Um, this is why we, we wrote the principles. We felt that we, f we wanted to be transparent to our constituency and say, this is how we've been doing enforcement for years. I'm happy to talk to you about it if you think there's a better way. I've been thinking about it for 20 years and this is the best way we know of. And now the political challenges are worse than they've ever been. So we need your help. The last battle I want to talk about before I go to questions um, is the question of the complete corresponding source code. Uh, I've been criticized uh, about enforcement by even people who used to do enforcement about how it doesn't necessarily upstream code. That much is true, but there's another really important part that's even in GPLv2. It's longer and more detailed in GPLv3, but the concept's the same. This idea of the scripts used to control compilation and installation of the executable. We call this in the GPL enforcement lingo the complete corresponding source, or CCS. Making sure that when you go buy a device, which now, as we heard this morning, is going to be your refrigerator and your litter box and whatever else it's going to be, they're going to be running Linux, and you're going to want to rebuild it and reinstall it. If you don't have that complete corresponding source, which the GPL promises you, it doesn't really matter about upstreamable code. Maybe the code is even upstream. But if you don't have the scripts used to control compilation and installation of the executable, you are not going to be able to put a new firmware on that litter box, on the refrigerator, on your drone. That's why you need projects like Pilot that we just heard about that's under GPLv3, because it will assure that you get that, but we also have to enforce the license to make sure. And so we're going to have to continue to do the overwhelmingly tedious process of verifying these source code releases and making sure that they work when violators give them to us. That's the hardest part about enforcement, is checking over and over again for these source releases to see if they work, because they try to give us ones that don't work on purpose to see if we'll just agree that that's compliant. I, I don't know if this is an actual cunning plan. Nobody laughed at my Black Otter joke, so you probably don't think it is. Um, maybe you've never seen, maybe you're all too young to have seen Black Otter. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, software freedom is, is an underdog, and with this co-option, we're even more of an underdog. So I admit that the plan we have is pretty simple-minded. It's, uh, it's a few components. Keep your own copyrights, make sure that enforcement happens by funding us and giving your copyrights forward for that, write free software on your own time that's copylefted, and help us with CCS when you can. Pretty simple plan, I admit. Not all that cunning. Um, but I think it plays to our strengths. What it calls for is everybody in the community to start caring about this and paying attention that copyleft is under threat and we need to work together to solve it. We know how to do this as a community. We know how to get together and solve a problem collaboratively. And so, since we started that whole idea, I think we can, sorry for the management speakiness on the slide, but we're going to utilize our core competency to defend copyleft. I can't do this alone. Conservancy, Karen and I can't do this alone. We're going to need your help. We need your copyrights. 
to be ready to fight for copyleft, and we need your financial support. So I hope you'll help, and I'm happy to take questions. Before I go to questions, there is a, a Conservancy lunch today, which you can only attend if you are a supporter. Um, if you want to come and become a supporter today, you can. Uh, you can do. I, I did the math this morning. It's U.S. $120, and I think that's $167 Australian today. Um, so if you want to do that, or if you just want to promise you're going to do it and give me your email address, uh, we, we will trust you. Uh, but so we're meeting uh, out by after the talk's over. We're meeting out by the uh, by the registration desk. Um, and thanks to Ben here for organizing it. For where uh, people end up automatically being part of, uh, well, you know, not necessarily assigning copyrights to uh, the Conservancy, but uh, assigning the right to enforce those copyrights to a central organisation like the Conservancy. Um, so I, I, I much prefer the almost anarchistic community mechanism of having people have their own copyrights and make each make individual decisions to affiliate with some organisation to do enforcement. Um, I, 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 I think that the, the, the question of could GPL be forced solve this is an interesting one. I don't think it would be through that mechanism. Um, I, th th there, there, I've had ideas. So there's this mechanism in GPL v3 called a, a proxy for deciding the or later clause, right? So v2 didn't have this. v3, you can say, actually, I named this person to decide later if they want to make it or later or only uh, GPL v3, only GPL v3 or later. Um, we could do a similar proxy system for enforcement. Um, I don't know if it would work. Um, it's an interesting idea, but the problem is, is that Linux is now the battleground, and Linux is GPLv2 only. I, I, I mean, this is where I disagree with Stallman. I, I think GPLv2 is a fine license to have the battle over, um, and I, I don't have a, I'm not afraid of doing that. I've done a lot more GPLv2 enforcement than GPLv3 enforcement. Samba is pretty much the only GPLv3 program I've ever done enforcement for. Um, it is a better license, V3 is, um, but I, I don't think we could change the license to fix the enforcement question. Um, we just need to pay more attention. Uh, I, the number of people I run into who don't even know whether their company holds their copyrights or not is, is, is surprisingly high. And so those types of, of community questions should be asked. Um, uh, uh, and I think we need to just ask them more often. I don't, where's the mic? There's hands over here. Oh, I'm out of time? <laughs>